I'm going to turn the lights down a little bit. There. How's that? Like more dark? If it's too dark, let me know. Um, all right. Well, thank you all for being here. It's great to uh, have a chance to meet you guys from CFO and uh, welcome you here. Um, we're really grateful for uh, Chuck reaching out and uh, setting up a collaboration between CFO and some of the entities here in the Gunnison Basin that are working on especially cheatgrass management and control, which turns out to be one of our greatest threats to Gunnison sagegrass survival. I'll talk quite a bit about that uh, here uh, this evening. Um, but so just super grateful to you guys for your uh, interest in the Gunnison sage grouse and for um, all that uh, you're doing to help us uh, keep this bird on the plant. So, um, it's a pretty cool bird and uh, there's not a whole lot of them and they're only found in one dot in the map so they have a whole bunch of you know what makes a what makes a species vulnerable what makes a species um, susceptible to extinction uh, you can check off a lot of the uh, those key threat factors for the species um, especially with its uh, really unique mating system, which even makes it more vulnerable to extinction due to the, to the uh, genetic issues with this case. So anyway, uh, thank you for being here. And I hope, uh, I just wanted to share a little bit with you about um, you know, what's it like uh, uh, seeing and observing these birds, some of their ecology, and then uh, Quite a bit on the conservation of the species. I don't want this to be keep you up too late and to go too long. So just let me know how you're feeling, and uh, we can cut it off anytime you want. I know I have way too many slides, so I'll uh, I'll try to be concise. <clears throat> As you know, tomorrow's Earth Day, so I'm excited you guys are here to uh, celebrate the Gunnison Sage Grouse on Earth Day. Uh, I don't know if I actually introduced myself. So I'm Pat McGee, and I'm a uh, professor here at Western. This is my, I think, 26th year of being here at Western. It's a great place to be, great uh, university, great uh, location. And also, back in 2000, I started an organization called Siskiyou, and it's a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to the conservation of the Gunnison sage grouse. We've been working with partners for all that time. Uh, to help implement the Gunnison Sage Girls Conservation Plan, which is evolving into different kinds of uh, planning efforts now under the Fish and Wildlife Service because it's a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Um, the main thing Siskiyou has done over the years is help with the Watchful Wildlife Site, and we manage that for the partners, uh, both for commercial viewing and for uh, general. It's kind of a challenging site in many ways, but it is the opportunity that people have to see the things in sage grouse. And our main goal is just to protect the bird and try to reduce any kind of disturbance to the bird. In some ways, we failed already, but uh, birds are smart. <laughs> Most people don't say the birds are smart. I think the birds are smart. They kind of solve their own problem. <laughs> so, uh, but it makes it a little tougher on people. <laughs> okay, so. This is a scene <coughs> out in the uh, Sagebrush Sea. And uh, every year, uh, those of us who are uh, focused on the conservation of Gunnison sage grouse, the research on Gunnison sage grouse, we go out in the early spring and we sit in the dark, as you all will do tomorrow, and we wait for the sunrise. And uh, we're waiting for uh, something that a lot of indigenous uh, cultures talk about in reference to grouse, prairie grouse in general, is uh, the eternal return, the sacred spiral. And it's this idea of this rhythm of life that uh, Gunnison sage grouse have. They have an annual cycle. And they go around this cycle, and every year at this time, uh, they are coming back to the uh, beginning of the cycle, to the uh, to springtime, to new beginnings, new life, to the opportunity to mate breed and to start a new generation of Gunnison sage grouse. So we wait in the dark and we, uh, we wait with sort of suspension in our hearts, hoping that these birds are gonna show up because of their small numbers. And uh, 
you know, so far they've, they've been coming back. Um, so we'll, we'll hope that you get to see them tomorrow. Um, as you're waiting in the dark, uh, at least in some locations, you before you can see anything, you hear all these really interesting, bizarre sounds that the Gunnison Safe Ghosts make. And, uh, and then when the sun rises, um, this is what uh, appears before your eyes. And it's just such a uh, bizarre bird, right? And it's uh, got all these really interesting characteristics. Um, these big phylloplumes we were talking about earlier that are, uh, you can see on the mount here that they are actually feathers on the neck. And then they erect those feathers up over their head and it becomes this big, <coughs> excuse me, this big, long, thick ponytail. Um, this is one of the things that distinguishes the venison sage grouse from the greater sage grouse. It fans this tail. You can see the striping pattern on that tail. And then, of course, the most crazy thing are these big air sacs that are sticking out of their chest, out of the white fluff of the chest. And they jiggle these out while they do. Um, <clears throat> these males show up on the uh, mating ground, which is called the LAC, the L-E-K. And they start showing up on the LEX about mid-March. And they come basically every single day uh, in the dark, they show up on the LEX and they start doing these dances. And they're dancing and they are uh, uh, also putting out these vocalizations. And these air sacs are uh, resonating vocalization. So in birds, we have, you know, humans, we have our voice box, if they're birds, have their voice box down here uh, called the syrinx. It's right at the branch where the two bronchi go into the lungs. So that sound is being generated from deep inside the body. It's a low frequency sound and these air sacs help to uh, resonate that sound out. We kind of think of the lex as being uh, acoustic beacons. And that sound is traveling out through the sagebrush several miles, some people say. Um, depending on the acoustics and on the uh, airflow and things like that. But it's probably a, uh, a good um, advertisement for first year males that have ne never been to a lot before and to the females to show them where the males are. So anyway, this is the gathering spot, the lack. And uh, these birds are just working really hard on the lack every single day. The females show up in uh, less predictably Right? And we can talk more about them. Here's a female, kind of looks like a whole different species. Um, but what's going on with the uh, uh, evolution of this species is that there's this really intense uh, sexual selection. And so in sexual selection, what's happening is the males are competing for the opportunity to breed and the females are the ones choosing which males to breed. So it sometimes seems the other way around, like the males actually choose who they want to mate with, but it's not. Females drive this whole lek mating system. And a lek mating system is a really uh, extreme uh, example of polygyny. Polygyny is this idea where one male mates with multiple females. And so this is extreme polygyny. And um, what happens is the uh, uh, all the females, they show up at the lek and they start looking at these males and they start trying to decide which male they want to mate with. And uh, most of them choose the same male. So you get about uh, 10 to 15% of the males that actually mate on most lacks. That means, you know, think about this the other way, that means uh, 85 to 90% of the males are not mating. So that's extreme competition. So what's driving this competition is these traits that the females are looking at, and we call them honest signals. So there's something about <clears throat> whatever the females are seeing, whether it's the ponytail or the tail or the uh, air sacs or the sounds, whatever it is that they're choosing, uh, those are honest signals that these males have fitness, have higher fitness than the other male. So that translates into better reproductive success for the females. So anyway, if only, 10% of the males get to mate, that's this intense competition. And so we get this different selective forces working on the males and the female. The male selective forces are going for these breeding traits. The female selective forces are going for something that is uh, less you know, obnoxious and uh, 
and uh, uh, bizarre in terms of the plumage, but this is a ground nesting bird that needs to blend in uh, to its environment. So that's what's driving this section. So we got females moving this way in terms of their traits, males moving this way. They look like two different species, but they're not, of course. Um, so here is a couple males hanging out on the left uh, on an early morning. As I said, they show up every single day, pretty much, unless the only times I don't see them is when there might be a big snowstorm or something like that. But uh, most days they show up. And when the males are doing this mating display, they are expending about 13 times their basal metabolic rate. This is as much, if not more, than sustained migratory flight. So this is the most expensive thing that sage grouse do, that male sage grouse do. And you can imagine after two months, so from mid March to mid May, every morning doing this for several hours that they get pretty exhausted. And the main time of the year when you see male mortality is the end of May and the first part of June. But uh, many of these males are just spent and they end up dying. I mean, uh, sage grouse don't live that long. A four-year-old sage grouse is a very old bird. So two, three years old, they're living a good life. Uh, but uh, these males are mostly dying at the end of the, the life cycle. Um, which one of these is a gunnison sage grouse? The one on the right. Good. So you can see some of the differences here with the ponytails of the greater sage grouse. Much uh, shorter in length and not as thick. Um, so they kind of uh, don't look as much like a big long ponytail as you see over here. Uh, there's that tail, really contrasting uh, banding. This is more of a model tail. Um, these also have the big air sacs. You just don't see it in this photo uh, for the greater sage grouse and the venison sage grouse. So that's not really a difference. Um, <clears throat> those are some of the key features. Also, the greater sage grouse is quite a bit larger, about a third the size of the venison sage grouse. And they have unique different behaviors. They make unique vocalizations and they uh, have unique genetics. So we have a person up at the USGS uh, out of Fort Collins that has done all the Gunnison and Greater Sage Grouse genetic work and has really uh, nailed this down that they, these are very different birds. And when you look back historically, you know, we have uh, at least 160,000 years since Greater and Gunnison Sage Grouse were ever in contact with each other like, uh, isolation. So long term uh, different. Um, by the way, Anything south of the Colorado River is a Gunnison sage grouse. Anything north or west is a greater sage grouse. This is just a, this isn't the best video, but it just shows a little bit of the, I don't think there's sound is super low. Oh, there you go. Look this real ritualistic dance where they take a couple steps, they lift their wings up. They thrust their head forward with that ponytail. And as they do that, the air sacs come out. And they make those vocalizations. At the end of that display, you can see this little quiver and their tail quivers. And then they usually uh, let out the, uh, at least partially deflate the air sac. And then they start over. They take a couple steps. They move around. They're a lot more um, mobile than the greater sage. The greater sage just seem to have like a little spot on the left. And they just go around the little circles physical geographical location, uh, Gunnison sage grouse are a lot less tied to a, a geographical location to move around the left. Gulping some air. By the way, <coughs> the, this idea that the females choose, uh, the way they do that is that uh, the males are doing their stuff and the females are walking around um, and uh, the females are looking at each of these males and assessing and then eventually they have to give a signal to the male when they're ready uh, to mate. And so what they usually do is they just 
lay them those down on the ground and spread their wings out, and then a male can mount them. This uh, whole copulation takes about two seconds, <laughs> very fast. And then the female shakes her whole body after that and sort of walks around and usually then leads the way. Yeah. Do the females come back or is it just a one population? No, they can come back. Uh, it can be just one population, um, but they can mate with several males. But again, not that many males actually do the mating. Um, but then the other thing that happens is later in the season, if they lose a nest, they can still come back and mate it a second time. We oftentimes we do see a peak in females later in the season, and that's really why the males are hanging out for so long all the way into mid May. Uh, this time of year, like this weekend, we're scheduled to get some snow, um, and if it's enough snow, it can uh, kill the nests, freeze the eggs, and stuff. And so the females come back. But yeah, these males. Uh, one of my friends who is a sage grouse researcher up in, uh, she's out of. Um, University of California Davis, but she studies greater sage grouse in Wyoming. And she saw one male mate with 23 females in two hours. So that's how this extreme polygamy goes. But here they are. Uh, sometimes this uh, behavior gets into some more physical violence, and the birds are fighting each other. Um, they get chest to chest, and they start using their wings and they slap each other. That sound is travels very long distance, you can actually hear these uh, wing slaps. And sometimes they drop blood, but usually it's just a, a momentary conflict and then one usually uh, runs away from the other. So that's how they kind of establish these mating hierarchies. <clears throat> Metaphorically, these birds are also really fighting for their survival. And uh, the whole survival of the species is dependent on this. Of course, the venison sage grouse is a sagebrush obligate bird. Um, its whole life revolves around the sagebrush ecosystem. So the main thing for conservation, we have to focus on their habitat. Um, the Gunnison Basin is a special place. Um, it's one of the, you know, maybe two or three still fairly intact sagebrush ecosystems in Colorado. And uh, because of that, about 87 or 88 percent, we just had a conference a couple weeks ago and Colorado Parks and Wildlife just gave their most recent data but they said 88% of the global population of Gunnison sage grouse are found in the Gunnison Basin. 88% is one spot on the map, right? So this is uh, in a way, you know, that it's telling us two things. One is telling us this is the best habitat that's left and this is the only real habitat that can sustain the species at this at the current um, it's also telling us that it's a very scary situation because when you have one dot on a map for a species to exist, it's a, it's a very precarious situation if anything goes wrong in this system. Um, so yeah, sagebrush obligates, and here's the stage, which is all the that sacred spiral, that eternal return uh, takes place within the sagebrush ecosystem. And here's what it looks like a little bit. This is the annual cycle of the Gunnison sage grouse. As I mentioned, we start here in the spring with their breeding, their courtship, the mating that we just talked about. After that copulation, the females go off into the sagebrush and uh, they start looking for a nest site. Um, and so they're, <clears throat> they might spend a week or so looking for a nest site. And uh, that's after they've copulated, right? So they could store sperm for a little while. And then they uh, fertilize the eggs and lay their eggs. Uh, there's a nest up here on the table, so if you haven't seen that, you can check it out. But it's a, uh, a brown nest that is uh, under the sagebrush. And uh, these birds are absolutely amazing. Everything about the Gunnison sagebrush is about loyalty. They are a very loyal species, and they have this fidelity to an ecosystem, to a habitat, to a certain plant, to a way of life. Um, everything about them. And and so it's hard being that kind of bird when things are changing around you all the time. But these birds, these females, they lay their eggs, oftentimes between six to 12 eggs in a clutch. This one has eight. And uh, once they lay them, they don't, they don't start incubating until the whole clutch is laid. And then they start incubating. It's about a 30-day incubation period. And those females sit on those eggs 96% of the time. 
They leave the nest for twice a day for 15 minutes to make a quick little feeding bowel. And then they're back on the nest. 96% of the time, they're so loyal. They're so faithful to their nest and to uh, their, their duty to raise the next generation of venison safely. But they're also incredibly vulnerable sitting on the ground for 30 days straight. They're incredibly vulnerable. So um, what this is showing is uh, a lack Right on this on this contour map, and we've got this circle. This is a two mile radius around the lack. Uh, we've kind of expanded that circle with more recent research, but but somewhere between two and four miles around the lack is where about eighty plus percent of the females that visit that lack nest. <clears throat> so if we're looking for you know uh, important areas geographically within the sagebrush sea. That need to be protected and managed. First, the lax. We can identify those and protect those. And then secondly, that area around the left where so much of the nesting happens. So that's a that's a strategy. And we have mapping inventory processes where all of those circles are, are built. And we look at the habitat within those circles and uh, try to do restoration of that habitat and protection of that habitat. Um, this uh, photo right here is you can kind of see right there, there's a female, a hen, that's sitting on a nest. This would be an example of a good nest site because we've got the sagebrush canopy and lots of dense grasses and cover underneath that to conceal that bird that's sitting on the ground. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the nesting habitat is sagebrush with bare ground underneath. And this just isn't a good place for a sagebrush to be successful in raising young. So one of the main concerns we have in the conservation of this species is nesting habitat, making sure that the birds have the right kind of habitat, structural habitat that, that can uh, support their success in uh, raising young. So after <clears throat> that 30 day period, all the eggs hatch on the same day at the same time. And so the chicks come out, we call them precocial young. So they're ready to leave the nest immediately. They're relatively well developed and they follow the female around. Within a few days, they go on a pretty long journey away from the nesting habitat to a new habitat. And that's shown over here. This is the brood rearing habitat. Um, Plate Braun, who is one of the uh, key venison sage grouse research biologists who was making some of the early observations about that this bird was different than the other sage grouse in North America. <clears throat> he calls this uh, a death march. So the chicks are following the hen through this really arid sagebrush system. And what they're trying to do is find a wetter microhabitat, a wetter place in the landscape where there's insects primarily. They got to eat a lot of insects. They have, they have a high protein diet to be able to grow. Within 10 days, they can fly. And uh, it's amazing like how much biomass they're putting on, how they're doubling their body mass and so on, and uh, reaching flight stage in 10 days. Um, within, you know, by 30 days, they're pretty much the same size as the hens. And uh, that's, a, that's a tough thing to do, to grow that fast. You have to have the right resources. And the best place to find that is in a relatively mesic or wetter location where there's water, where there's insects, where there's forbs, wildflowers, you're drawing pollinators in. And so those are the kinds of things that these chicks are eating. The adults are eating more of a varied diet of forbs and insects as well during this time of year. Um, but talking about uh, bottlenecks and, and challenges in the annual cycle of the Gunnison sage grouse, this is probably the major problem that Gunnison sage grouse face, um, or one of the main problems. That's a lack of this kind of brood rearing habitat um, because what we've seen over the last century or so is almost a complete hydrological collapse of the sagebrush ecosystem. The, the sagebrush used to be a place where you could find perennial streams running through. You could definitely find ephemeral streams with all kinds of seeps and springs and wet meadows. And uh, it was a relatively wet place compared to what we see today. Today, it's much, much drier. We're seeing all kinds of things that are happening that are causing the water table to drop and for the uh, sagebrush to be a, a drier place. 
this is really restricting those wet meadow habitats, those weeds of habitats that the broods need to survive. So this is a really big bottleneck in the annual cycle and a huge challenge for these birds to um, find the right habitat close enough to you know, the adjacency to the nest sites <coughs> so that they can uh, get the resources they need. You can see in this picture that this is kind of a, a, a hay meadow. So these birds will use hay meadows, irrigated hay meadows, but notice what's right next to it. My cursor will look, uh, sagebrush. They're not gonna be way out here in the middle of the meadow. They're gonna be on the edge of the meadow where there's sagebrush nearby. And they really need sagebrush throughout the end of cycle. Every part of their life cycle, they have sagebrush as part of that. Um, after uh, the summer and into the fall, these broods reach mature or not maturity, but they they uh, they are ready to fledge and to move on. And so usually they form larger um, flocks of birds. And again, they move to all these sites. These leks are traditional sites where they, the birds have a lot of fidelity. They go back year after year after year to the same lek, uh, the nesting habitat the same way, the brood-rearing habitat the same way. And then in the fall and moving into winter, they also go back to seasonal areas that they've used historically uh, year after year, the same winter. In winter, they need sagebrush. They eat 99% of their diet is sagebrush. And so they're looking for places where there's sagebrush up above the snow. And oftentimes this is on Southwest facing slopes and uh, rocky areas that there's a lot of sage, they get a lot of sun and wind and so on that uh, knocks the snow back. Um, or like in this photo, this is kind of a little ravine and the sagebrush grows taller in these little wetter microsites. So this was a picture actually taken way back in 1984 and uh, it was a big winter and almost all the sagebrush is covered with snow except this one little uh, spot where it's taller. And, uh, and it, the other thing that sagebrush do, <coughs> Gunnison sagebrush way much more than uh, greater sagebrush is they burrow in the snow. And so uh, just like a ptarmigan. So under that snow cover, they get a lot of protection from the night sky, a lot of radiative heat loss from the wind. It's a really nice microhabitat underneath the snow. So that's a key feature. One thing we've been seeing with climate change and with some of these weird winter snows is that um, sage grouse do really well in the winter. We said that males mostly die at the end of the lecking season. Females mostly die during the incubation season. And then uh, they do really well in the winter, like 90% survival over winter for these birds. So that you think that that's such a challenging time, especially in Gunnison, so cold, but they do really well. But what we found is that now we're getting these warmer conditions where snow is falling and, and even mixed with rain, with really wet snows. And then they freeze, then it gets 20 below and you get this hard snow cover the grouse can't penetrate. In fact, some of the ranchers uh, up Ohio Creek were telling me they were driving their tractor over the snow and not falling in. Elk are walking on top of the snow, not falling in. So a sage grouse can't penetrate that, get into the submidian environment and find that protection in the snow bar. So this could be a big problem. They'd be more susceptible to the environment, more susceptible to predators up on top of the snow. We'll have to watch that. Anyway, this brings us around the circle and we're back to this eternal winter. Um, so just real quick, I'll, I'll try to speed up. I'm taking longer than I want to. I, I can't, it's good biology. Um, but this is, uh, this is the historic and current range of the Gunnison sage grouse, and they only occupy about 10% of their historic range. So again, if we restate that, they've lost 90% of their distribution across this uh, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico range. range. Um, so we can see all this light green is the historic distribution, the darker green is the current distribution. And then if we blow that up, we can see that there's seven populations uh, that exist today, although some of them don't have any birds, at least uh, didn't last year. So um, here's Gunnison and 88% uh, global population is right here. When you look at you know, a bigger picture of this and you think about where do you find Gunnison safe grouse in the world, it really is one dot in southwestern Colorado going into southeast Utah. 
one dot on the map for the global species distribution. We really look in that under a microscope, we can find seven little dots, one relatively bigger dot compared to the six other very, very small dots where we're talking about less than 200 birds in all this population. So um, it's, it's, this is a big challenge. Um, here's the population <coughs> counts over the last 50 or 25 years. And uh, you can see this is a three year uh, average count. So it sort of uh, takes away some of the extremes from annual variation. But grouse populations just naturally go up and down quite, uh, quite a bit, you know, pretty high amplitude fluctuations interannually. Um, but what we're seeing here from 1996 to last year is uh, relatively, you know, uh, small population that's fluctuating. You know, we got up here over 5,000 birds for just a little bit. And then we've seen for the last five or six years, a pretty steady decline. I think this year we're going to see an increase in this, a bump is what I've been seeing and hearing is the uh, good news at the Lex this year. But this is the global population of the Gunnison Sea. 2,717 birds. And this is the more generous model that we use. We have a second model that puts that down closer to about 2,200 um, in the world. Right? So if you think about that, there's very few birds, most endangered birds or the most endangered mammal species that you look at around the world. We talk about elephants, we talk about tigers, things like that. I mean, they have 10,000 or something tens of thousands of individuals still left in this population. So um, this, is, this is a population that is incredibly vulnerable to extinction. Something could happen this year, like a disease could come into the population and 2,700 birds would be gone like that. So this is a, a very precarious situation. Um, by the way, the way that we, I'll go back to this for a second. The way that we get this data is that we go out uh, and count the leks. And in the gun space, there's about 80 different leks, but only about half of those are active. And many of those 40 that are active have less than 10 birds on the lek. So most of them are very small, but we count those leks four times a year from uh, in four 10 day periods and we get the high male count. And we take the high male count for the season and we plug it into a model that says we're only seeing 75% of the males. So we assume we don't see all the males. So if you get uh, 75 males, I don't know if it's the male. anyway, uh, you would say you have 100 males, right? Um, that are actually out there. And then you assume, based on uh, data that we collected from uh, radio telemetry studies, that there's 1.6 females for every male. It's the sex ratio of the population. So we take 100 males and then we have 200 or 160 females, right? Uh, and then we put those together with the population. So that's how we come up with this number. And last year, the high male count for the whole total population was 543 males. So that's how you get the two percent. Yeah. Your last number could you say? It was a little over a thousand males. Well, uh, you know, we had 543 males, and then so multiply that times 0.75, and then add that number to 543. So it's going to be a little less than close, yeah, probably 750 or 800. Is anybody doing the math? <laughs> Figure that I can do. Okay. Anyway, um, this is uh, you know thinking about that population size. This number in the last twenty five years, there's not that much fluctuation going on in right? We're going from four thousand to less than six thousand down to two thousand. But historically, there were a lot more birds on this landscape. We don't have any numbers, we don't have any data, but we do have some interesting um, anecdotes, and this is one of them. Uh, this comes from the Lake City newspaper in 1894. Lake City is just south of us here, 
And this fireman named Billy Green went out to Sapanera Mesa, which is west of Venison. On one Sunday afternoon, they printed this in the newspaper, he uh, bagged 863 grouse. Remember what I just said, the high male count last was 500 and uh, I'd like to say 543. Um, so more grouse bagged in one Sunday afternoon than the entire global count of males last year. That's so just to imagine being a hunter and you're out there on the landscape and you can shoot 800 birds in a couple hours, how abundant those birds must have been. And they're just flushing up everywhere, right? So we were up here back in uh, 1894 and with all of this over exploitation, I think we went from here down to orders of magnitude decline in the population center. In fact, in 1916, a guy named William Hornaday, that some of you might recognize that name, he's uh, thought of being the person that saved the bison, or one of the people that saved the bison from going extinct. He wrote this big uh, treatise that said, it was to the 17 Western states, it said, the uh, extinction of the Dennis, they called it the sage chicken. The extinction of the sage chicken is on your hands. The blood of this species is on your hands. You don't do anything, it's going extinct. This was in 1916 because of all this over-exploitation. Uh, 100 plus years later, we're still worried about the extinction of the species, but for other reasons as well. I think this over-exploitation took us from here way down to here, and it was one of the main causes of this population decline. Um, the next thing that happened, of course, was part of what Jared Diamond calls the evil quartet. Number one is over-exploitation. Number two is habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation. This is an amazing thing that happened starting in probably the 1930s, going all the way into the 1970s. And it was called conservation. And it was called range improvement. And what the, what, and if you look in the journals, of the Journal of Range Management, you'll find all these publications by top range scientists, right? They're looking for how to get rid of that one undesirable species, sagebrush. And so they're trying to get rid of this to increase forage for livestock grazing. And this is how they would do it. This is called chaining. There's a big bulldozer here. There's another bulldozer that you can't see out of the photo. And these are these, there's this big chain with all these big metal uh, pieces on it. And uh, they're just dragging this across the sagebrush, tearing out the sagebrush. They also mowed, bisque, roto, uh, uh, roto, what's it called? Roto something. Not roto till the roto, again, it's not coming to me. Um, uh, and just all these kinds of physical, mechanical manipulations, as well as chemical manipulation and spraying the sagebrush and pulling, you know. And what we're talking about is not a few acres, we're talking about hundreds of millions of acres of sagebrush were treated this way across three or four decades. Uh, all in the name of trying to improve the range conditions for livestock. And uh, so imagine the sage grouse populations up here in the late 19th century, down to here with over exploitation, down to here with all of this loss of habitat. This is the time when they just lost the habitat. So um, big deal. And then uh, we can see that uh, lots of other things were happening to this landscape as well. This is a photo. Uh, taken west of uh, Gunnison, <clears throat> probably in the early 1960s. And what you're seeing here is the Gunnison River right, traveling through, uh, flowing through that valley. Um, this is what it looked like in the uh, mid 1960s. This is Blue Mesa Reservoir, the largest body of water in Colorado, 30 miles long. When that uh, dam was completed and that reservoir was flooded, it took out 30 miles of riparian habitat, including a lot of sage grouse, music habitat for that blue green area, as well as lax. There's a really poignant story that took place here in the first March after the reservoir was filled. The reservoir was iced over, and this location where there was a lack, the birds came onto the ice directly above the exact location where the lack was. Uh, that lek had over 300 birds on it historically. That first year, about 150 came back, uh, tried to dance on the ice, but it didn't really work very good. And then over the next several years, just fewer and fewer birds uh, came back to that uh, lek lek state. Uh, talking about loyalty and fidelity uh, to a site. 
Um, so yeah, habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, habitat degradation, all kinds of transmission lines, roads, all kinds of stuff fragmenting the habitat. This species requires large areas of intact sagebrush. And so when you fragment it up, they just don't do that. Well. This causes opportunities for the invasion of weeds as well as uh, increased success of predators moving into the sea of sage. It's no longer a sea, it's puddles of sage. We'll talk more about this, but uh, the other, the third part of Jared Diamond's evil quartet is the introduction of invasive species. And this, of course, is cheatgrass that has come into the Denison Basin and it's really starting to gain momentum and it's becoming number one or number two probably threat to the Denison sage grass. Um, okay, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but this is just showing us that we've gone through a lot over the last 25 years in terms of how do we conserve the Gunnison sage grouse. What's the approach? What's the best way to do it? In 2014, the Gunnison sage grouse was listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And so since then, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been responsible for creating a recovery plan and a uh, what we call a recovery implementation strategy, which is a more detailed recovery plan. And that's got the meat of what are the activities on the ground that we need to do to uh, Recover the Denison sage grouse. So that's kind of where uh, the focus of conservation is going. And these are just, we, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but you can just take a quick look down this list of a, the, kind of the variety and the scope, the breadth of uh, some of the different kinds of conservation actions that have been going on, on to, to benefit the Denison sage grouse. Anything from just closing trails, and you can see this is. We have this great organization called Gunnison Trails that are really on board with Gunnison sage grouse conservation. They work with us really closely on uh, weed control and trail closures and education of the public. And it's just a great organization to work with. This is a place called Hartman Rocks, south of town here. It is a world-class mountain biking location. Uh, people come from all over the place to come right here. So we're trying to make sure that that activity doesn't uh, have negative impacts to sage. If you just look at some of these things like prohibiting hunting, that happened way back in 2000. Uh, all kinds, oh, we have this shed antler <coughs> uh, policy and regulation that was passed by the state and uh, it started here in Gunnison. And, um, we are keeping those, uh, everybody that wants to just go pick up um, antlers, the dropped off elk and mule deer. Uh, but when they go in there, they're harming the elk and mule deer, sometimes getting there before the antlers have fallen off their heads and chasing them around in the winter when they're so vulnerable, uh, these big game species. But then moving into spring, trying to attack, uh, the, especially early in the morning, uh, the areas where sage grouse are. So that's kind of an interesting one. Um, all kinds of different habitat restoration, conservation easements are protecting private lands in perpetuity. So you put a conservation easement on it and that landowner forfeits the development rights for the property but gets a payment uh, in return. Um, a little bit of captive rearing uh, going on, which is interesting. Uh, and just all kinds of stuff. Here's the cheap grass management plan and action that we'll talk more about. Um, just a couple of photos. This is a group that uh, we were out with in uh, the fall and all these little buckets were filled with little plastic fence markers. And there's not a lot of data, but the data that does exist shows that fences and sage grouse actually do run into barbed wire fences quite often, and especially around Lex, where they're taking off at low, uh, low altitude. And it's dark, you know, low light, they run into a fence. And uh, so we're putting these little markers on the fence to try to make fences more visible. Um, and here are, this is actually the head guy of the Gunnison Field Office of BLM. He's out with some students and us. This is Signal Peak right behind the college. Um, we had a road closure to protect Gunnison sage grouse. Some people just decided to go around the gate. So um, we're doing a couple things here. We're taking dead sagebrush and actually planting it in the ground and sometimes just putting it on the road to try to uh, reduce the visibility of the road. But uh, it's called dead planting when you actually dig a hole and plant a dead sage crush. And uh, it's a pretty good technique for reducing the visibility of a road. We're also planting real live sagebrush 
uh, here, and that's a effort to you know, restore that habitat. Um, these are some of my students. This is we're, we're right here right now. This is first hall, uh, right behind the college, getting rid of some old fence. <clears throat> For the last two years, my wildlife class has uh, working on a, a restoration plan for the sagebrush right behind the college and getting rid of fences and roads and trails. We hauled five truckloads of big metal, glass, everything, trash out of here. Uh, we're planting sagebrush. We're trying to get rid of crested wheatgrass uh, and cheatgrass as well. Um, and here's a group of my students uh, that were out in uh, the uh, last fall as well. This is called a One Rock Dam. This is a really exciting project. Uh, I think it has the most potential to really impact sagegrass habitat and the ability of this habitat to support uh, more abundant sagegrass populations. What this is in that root rearing habitat, it's making the land wetter. You know, we said we have the hydrologic collapse and the landscape is drying. This uh, stops the problem, <coughs> excuse me, stops the problem of, the, of the, these little gullies incising and the energy of the water cutting downward and dropping the water table. So the first thing it's doing is stopping that and then it's allowing for this uh, land to build back up and to reconnect the stream channel to the rest of the wet meadow and allow for this expansion of wet meadows and the right kind of habitat for grouse. So these guys are pretty excited. <laughs> Let me just focus a little bit on Chico. You guys doing okay? Okay, we'll try to uh, get through the cheatgrass stuff. This is cheatgrass. Um, here's another view of uh, starting about now <clears throat> in this uh, springtime, cheatgrass is emerging. Um, it's an annual grass, a non-native annual grass. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, I'm sure uh, many of you are, it was written in 1949. And way back then, even Alba Leopold has a whole chapter in there called Cheat Takes Over. He's talking about the invasion of cheatgrass into the Western United States. Luckily, the Gunnison Basin has been spared of this for the most part, probably because of the colder climate, the isolation of the Gunnison Basin, surrounded by mountain ranges. It's not that easy for things to come in here. Um, but starting in the 1990s, we had a BLM ecologist who was concerned about it. Nobody else cared about it. Uh, in fact, the weed people in Gunnison County just thought he was crazy. And uh, most people said, it's never going to be a problem. And he started documenting, he started mapping cheatgrass. And uh, now it is way, way more established here. And it's really starting to expand. I'll show you some photos of some of the uh, sites. And hopefully tomorrow morning, we'll get a chance to go out and look at some of these. But this is an annual grass. So it grows one season produces seeds, and then the individual plant dies, but it uh, creates a seed bank. So our biggest challenge is how do we manage the seed bank? It's already in the soil. And the thing about annual plants is they put all of their energy into reproduction. So they don't care about survival. They don't have to survive over winter. They don't have to survive droughts. They just grow fast and put all their energy into seed production. So they make thousands and thousands of seeds for one little plant. Right now, you can see this cheatgrass plant, and you can start seeing all these seed heads on it. This is still early in the spring. It's green, and it's growing fast. And that's going to start happening here any day. It'll be interesting what you see uh, tomorrow, because I'm sure the cheatgrass is already coming up. Uh, Bromus tectora. <laughs> Here's a site heading up to Crested Butte on Highway 135. And you can see there's the sagebrush ecosystem, but all this brown stuff is cheatgrass. What happens after the early growth in April, May, and just into the first week of June, is that then those seed heads are fully developed, the plant is done growing, and it goes into what's called the red phase and then the brown phase. And this is what it looks like in the summer. It's just all brown. And the timing of this is not good because what happens is now you get all this fine fuel on the landscape that is very uh, flammable. And it's also coinciding with the time in the Gunnison Basin across southwestern Colorado and so on is the monsoon season. 
there's lots of lightning strikes, there's lots of opportunity for ignition of fires. So the sagebrush has sort of sagebrush shrubs with an understory of cheatgrass, cheatgrass infiltrating the spaces, the bare ground spaces, which are more prevalent now than historically. A lot of the perennial native grasses have been decimated or, or definitely less uh, abundant than they were. So there's a lot more bare ground beneath that cheat or that sagebrush. Cheatgrass loves that. That's what it takes advantage of. So it starts growing and expanding. Now we have cheatgrass and sagebrush together. Here's a spot a little bit farther up the road. So you can start seeing that there's still some uh, sagebrush in here, but it's mostly turning into cheatgrass. It's very competitive. It's uh, taking over. We call this a monoculture, one plant. Right? Uh, there used to be a diverse ecosystem, now a monoculture. None of these species like sagegrouse can make a living in here. Uh, mule deer, elk can't make a living. The other sagebrush obligate bird species can't make a living in here. This is nothing to anybody. Even cattle don't like it. They, they might eat it a little bit early in the season when it's green. But when it gets to this stage, it's terrible for cattle. They get all the seed heads in their eyes and their ears and their mouth. It's very dangerous for the cows. So and it's horrible for recreationists because you uh, walk through here and your socks are going to be filled with these pokey, horrible seeds and you're a vector spreading it farther into the safe. So it's just not a good thing. Here's a, one, the reason I throw, show this slide is because this is west of town Rainbow, Rainbow Lake Road. This is seven miles off road. So we're starting to expansion into higher elevations. This road just goes like this. Oh, so seven miles up, you're already probably at close to 10,000 feet in this photo. So it's expanding, it's been green and then it turns to brown. And this is the biggest uh, cheatgrass place that we have in the basin west of town again by Blue Mesa Reservoir. This is part of the Currakani National Recreation Area called Din Dillon Pinnacles. Look at this hillside, that's all cheatgrass. There's nothing else there. That's what we're facing. And if the Gunnison Basin turns to this, the Gunnison sagegrass is there's no way. There's absolutely no habitat value here. There's no way for those birds to survive the winters eating sagebrush leaves. There's no place for those birds to nest. There's no place for those birds to find the brood during habitats. This spells absolute extinction for the venison sage. And it's already here in some places in the base. Challenge is we got to get on it fast and stop this and uh, turn it around. Um, Here's another view that was during the greener phase. This is what it looks like when it dries out. It's just not a pretty habitat. It's not a productive habitat. It's a very low wildlife habitat um, quality. Major transformation of an ecosystem. Um, so here's the points that I want to make. Um, here's the person's shoe and sock. All the, you know, when we go into that system, we're helping spread it. We're the vectors of spread. It's a very important issue for recreation. So right up here behind the college, that's the gateway to a BLM recreation area called Signal Peak. So all the trailheads are right there. All the college students and all the town people who get on mountain bikes, we do, I do, get on our running shoes, go hiking out there. And uh, we're, we're very likely to move those seeds deeper and deeper into the core area of sagebrush, what sage grouse are using. So here we go. Cheatgrass is present in the Gunnison Basin. It is here. There's a lot of it. It's expanding uh, quickly. Um, it's, it has spread significantly in the last 20 years. Um, it's found north of Gunnison. It's found east of Gunnison. It's found south of Gunnison. It's found west of Gunnison. It's all around. It's in Gunnison. Um, and at higher elevations, <clears throat> it really likes roadways and disturbed areas. So that's how it really starts to move uh, across the basin. If you just go over Monarch Pass and on the other side going down towards Salida, cheatgrass everywhere. It's almost completely cheatgrass along the roads. If you go that way west toward Montrose, cheatgrass everywhere. It's all dominant. We're very lucky because our landscapes don't look like that yet, but it's happening. We're watching that transformation right now in front of our faces. You don't have to go far to see what cheatgrass does. Um, 
it's not not only these big bucks, but if you're just hiking out in the middle of nowhere, you'll look down and there's some cheap grass, a little old patch. Those patches are going to expand, expand, and they're going to connect. So th that scares me the most. Um, it's on public lands and private lands. It's expanding from Gunnison. You can walk down the alleys of Gunnison, some of the old abandoned fields and stuff, and you find big patches of cheap grass right here in town. So we're really trying to work on that to get the local people to understand the cheap grass problem and try to avoid this vector of our recreation moving out to the rest of the sagebrush habitat. Um, and uh, yeah, it's gaining momentum. And unfortunately, cheatgrass is winning. Uh, cheatgrass is ahead of us. It's really expanding beyond our capacity right now to deal with it, address it, and to get on top. So it's a very scary situation. And the fate of this beautiful bird, this amazing rare bird, is really in the balance with cheatgrass. We have to do something better. And we have to do it quick. Um, so here's a little bit more about this amazing species, even though it's so infuriating, right? And it's really uh, has a very negative impact. It's absolutely amazing in terms of its evolution, what it's done to become an architect. You know, uh, what is the architecture, I guess, of this invading species? Uh, first of all, non native. Um, it's a uh, annual plant, as I mentioned earlier, and a cool season plant. So that means it's growing in the spring and the fall. It germinates in the spring, but it can also germinate in the fall at the end of the growing season and then over winter under the snow. And then when the snow melts, boom, it's just ready to go really quick. So cool season plant, it's taking advantage of the edge seasons when other native plants aren't really growing. It's got this advantage when it doesn't have the competition. It's got light, it's got soil, it's got more moisture at those edge seasons. So very smart, uh, very shallow root systems. It doesn't have to put a lot of energy into maintaining roots and to surviving over droughts and so on. It's a very shallow root system, which that's one that you can see the root too. That's real, like that's how big the roots are. A good thing about them having very shallow root systems, you can pick them really easy. If you grab a grass, you go, I think that's cheatgrass, and you can't get it out of the ground. It's not cheatgrass. That's a perennial plant with good roots. Cheatgrass, it's right out. Um, prolific seeds, as I said, an individual plant, thousands of seeds on one cheatgrass plant. This adds up when you got a square meter of dozens of cheatgrass plants. Now you're talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of seeds. Uh, being added to the soil in that seed bank. And then massive seed bank. And the seed bank is persistent for about five years right, for one seed. Lands in that seed bank or lands in that soil, and it can stay uh, alive and able to germinate for five years. That's what we that's the science that we have right now. Um, so each year new seeds are being added, right? So each year you've got five more years ahead. Um, rapid growth takes advantage of those windows of good growth and then matures early and uh, then senesces early. So it turns brown. By June 15th, all the cheatgrass is brown, uh, usually by like June 7th. So uh, we've got to, uh, we have an opportunity in the spring to try to pull cheatgrass, a physical manipulate, uh, manipulative way of dealing with it, uh, pulling it before those seed heads come out, and before, especially before the seeds mature. That's the best thing to get it out of the ground. It's expending its energy. We're not adding any new seeds to the seed bed. The problem is you can do that in one little area, like if we had the size of this room filled with cheetahs, all of us could go out there and we could pull it off. And it'd be great. But if you're talking about a landscape like filling pinnacles, or Red Creek, which is the one that we're targeting for this fall that you guys are helping us with. Uh, it's just way too much of 500 acres, 1,000 acres. There's no way people can pull that. Um, and then abundant fuels, the monsoons come. And then this is the part of the story that I didn't tell you, but fire, it burns. When it burns, it burns everything. The cheatgrass burns, sagebrush burns, all the other shrubs burn. All the perennial grasses burn, 
orbs burn, everything burns. You just have a blackened landscape. And what comes back after the fire? Cheatgrass that it doesn't kill the seed bank. It just burns the above ground stuff. The seed bank's there. What happens to sagebrush when it burns? dies and it's not like gamble oak it's not like service berry it's not like a lot of the a lot of shrubs are very fire adapted if they burn the root systems stay intact and they just sprout back up and so they're very adapted to fire but not cheap not sagebrush sagebrush is not dies when it burns and then it will take a good 15 20 years for that sagebrush to come back in after a fire and reestablish the site but the problem is after the fire, cheatgrass came right back. And now it's all cheatgrass because all the other stuff burned and it's taken over. And then that cheatgrass is going to have a much more frequent burning cycle. And the average burn cycle in a sagebrush is like 40 to 70 years. So now with cheatgrass in there, it's going to burn every five, seven, 10 years. So if it takes 10 years, 15 to 20 years, for sagebrush to come back in and fire is burning every five or 10 years, there's no chance for sagebrush to reestablish that site. So this monoculture of cheatgrass becomes a persistent monoculture. You've converted a sagebrush first ecosystem into a monoculture of an annual weed. It's a disclimax because the disturbance regime is so rapid. That's what we're facing. And uh, this is what happens. This is not a picture from Dunson. This is a picture from the Great Basin where there's millions of acres of cheatgrass. And there's millions of acres of sagebrush that have been taken out of sagebrush and converted into cheatgrass. This is all cheatgrass. That's what that landscape looks like. And this is a recent burn there. And this is going to come back into cheatgrass and it's going to persist as cheatgrass. There's no sagegrass that lives in this photo. There's no brewer sparrows or sage thrashers or green tail toeys that live in this photo It's horrible to range for big game. So anyway, what do we do about cheatgrass? And uh, we created an organization a few years ago, Jessica Young, who you'll meet tomorrow, and uh, me and uh, Kathy Broadhead, who's a wildlife biologist for Tennyson or for the BLM, and Brian Stevens, another BLM biologist. We uh, came together and we said, we got to do something good for sage grouse. Cheatgrass is a big issue. Let's, let's start really focusing on that. And so we created this organization. Eventually, it was first called Cheat Beer because we would get together uh, at least once a month and go have a beer and talk about cheatgrass and try to uh, plan things on the ground to actually do something for it. It became a little bit more formal. It's called the <coughs> Gunnison Basin Sagebrush Ecosystem Alliance, GBC. And so now we have that organization. We also have something called the uh, Gunnison Basin Sagebrush or Sagegrass um, Strategic Committee, which has been around since 2007. And it's kind of our county, our local working group for collaborative conservation for sagebrush. There's a technical subcommittee on there and they are starting to really take interest in cheatgrass. So we're hoping to sort of transfer a lot of what GBC did to this entity. That'll be the real workhorse for getting this cheatgrass management. Done. Also, the really exciting thing is right now, and you guys have been uh, helpful in this, is that we are about to hire a cheatgrass coordinator, a fully dedicated position, coordinate this effort to take on cheatgrass in the basin. After what we just heard, I hope that resonates with you that that's what we need. We really need someone to manage this situation, build capacity, to build momentum, to get after it now. I mean, the problem with Everybody else is that everybody else working on sage grass is that they have other full time jobs doing all kinds of stuff. They just don't have the capacity to focus on the cheap grass effort and keep things moving. So we really need that coordination piece. And we're super excited that CFO has been willing to help with that. And uh, but we also have a bunch of other entities that are putting in funding and we're going to get this fully funded position. And the county right now is about to send the uh, job description out. So very exciting, that's happening. Um, 
And then the other thing, you know, uh, I could spend way too much time talking about the slides, so I won't. But this is the other thing that I circled here that is the key to address this problem, getting on the ground, getting out. We have a really great, hopeful uh, vision, uh, thanks to Sudwick County, Wyoming, uh, got a hold of a woman up there who leads the county weed program. And starting in 2010, they had well over 50,000 acres of cheatgrass in Sudwick County. This is the core of greater sage-grass range in Wyoming. So they started this process of what do we do about cheatgrass? There, they went from 50,000 acres of cheatgrass to 100 acres of cheatgrass. I'm extremely excited. And what was their strategy? Well, they did a variety of different things, but a big element of it, and I know some people don't like this, and I don't really like it either, but it's herbicides and spraying the cheatgrass, because without that, we're going to lose the war on cheatgrass. There's just no other way. Oh, we're going to see these monocultures, and we're going to see the fire, and we're going to see cheatgrass win. Our only way to do it is with herbicides. And, uh, we have a particular herbicide that's pretty cool. Um, all herbicides, you know, it's just like all energy has its pros and its cons, trade-offs of everything. But this herbicide is pretty cool. It's called Rejuvia, and it's focused on annual grasses. It doesn't affect perennial grasses. It doesn't affect shrubs. Um, there might be some indication that it affects some of the other forbs in the system, but it doesn't seem to affect many of them. So uh, it's a pretty clean herbicide as far as herbicides go. You can't use it near water, which you're not supposed to use really any herbicides near water. And it doesn't seem to have any negative effects on animals uh, once it dries. And so the way you apply it is you apply it in this fine spray and within minutes, literally like a couple minutes, it's dry. And then it doesn't affect the animals. So uh, at least that's what I've been told and what I've understood from reading about. And then the big thing with Rejuvra <clears throat> is that its mechanism is exactly what we need. It's not killing the annual plant, it's killing the seeds in the seed bank. So what happens is you, after you apply the Rejuvra, it has to get down into the soil two to four centimeters. It doesn't really do much on the surface. It has to get to where those seeds are, two to four centimeters down. And the way to get it down there is with water. So the key to rejuver being successful is that you spray it and then you need rain or snow coming after the treatment. So of course you can't control that. So, you, but if you can time it, like in venison, you get that monsoon season and the cheatgrass is already done for the season in June. So by August, we can go in there and spray the cheatgrass and hope that those rains are going to come because it's the uh, monsoon season. Get that rejuvenate into the soil, two to four centimeters, and then that's where it deactivates the seedling. And uh, it has a, one of the nice things about it is it works on that seed bank for four years. It keeps the seeds from germinating for four years. Remember what I said before is that the seed bank is viable for five years. So you probably need to reapply Rejuvra in the fourth year to take care of that seed bank for the full uh, longevity of the seed bank. But when you only are applying once every four years for just two treatments total, then uh, it's a pretty low impact um, herbicide. The other one that they use a lot is called Plateau. Mazatec is another name for any of you familiar with herbicide. This one only lasts two years, so you have to apply it much more frequently. And it does have a lot more non-target effects. It, it's mostly targeted on annual grasses, and what we call a pre-emergent herbicide, same as Rejuver, that gets the seeds in the seed bank. But it does seem to affect other plants more than Rejuver does. So we don't really want to use that, <coughs> but in Wyoming, what they've done is they use what they call a cocktail. They have the rejuvra and the amazotic together. And so if you don't get that post spray moisture, bless you, then the nice thing about the amazotic is that it doesn't need that as much. It doesn't need the water to get it down into the seed bank. Um, so you kind of have a backup system to kill the cheatgrass if uh, you don't really get the moisture following the spray. So 
there's all these different <laughs> elements, um, but Rejuver is about the best thing that's come uh, for this specific purpose that we've seen. And I think it's really hopeful. Um, like many uh, people that are probably in CFO and Audubon and uh, any environmental group as any, you know, I would much rather not use herbicides. I would rather steer totally clear of herbicides and figure out a different way to do it. But we just don't have a different way to do it. And we don't have time to wait uh, to, you know, find something else. Or we're not going to have sagebrush and we're not going to have sagebrush. So it's really kind of that simple in my mind that if we don't do it now, we're, we're going to lose. Um, lots of other things going on with cheatgrass besides just um, getting that coordination and doing the treatments on the ground. Um, here's trying to tell the cheatgrass story. And uh, this is a, a local farmer's market. And we uh, built this whole kiosk uh, and we try to uh, educate the local people on what the issues with uh, cheatgrass is. So that's kind of a, a fun part of this, the uh, thing. Our mayor, a couple of years ago, proclaimed May 18th, Eradicate Cheatgrass Day for the city of Venice. We got a cool mayor and he's on board and, and he even got the city council to change the status of cheatgrass so it's a noxious weed in Venice. Um, so that is key because you have to have the right policies to be able to attack and put the resources to attack these plants. Um, here's cheatgrass pulling. This is, I just went out myself one day to get pulled by the high school and I have about two of those bags totally full of cheatgrass. I uh, spent about an hour pulling it and uh, you can see it growing here. That's what it looks like, fully seeded out, just not quite brown yet, still green. So this is the perfect time to pull it. It comes out super easy. You can fill a bag really quick. Here's Brian. Um, and this is what it looks like when you're spraying, right? They wear, uh, this is actually uh, not rejuvenate, but this other chemical. And they put this dye in it just so they can tell where they've already sprayed, so they can be more efficient. Um, but uh, we've done these things called the Strike Force Day. And this is really cool about Gunnison. And, and it means if you guys are investing in our program to benefit Gunnison Sage Girls, this is a great place to invest because we have partners that are so collaborative and so wonderful to work with. This, a, a Strike Force means it's an interagency. Uh, uh, weed control program. And that means the BLM, Brian works with BLM, is working on the state land, and the Forest Service is working on the state land, and the county is working on the state land, and uh, all these other entities. So we do it for the Park Service. So that's really unusual. I mean, a lot of times these entities only work on their own land. But we call this cross fence conservation. We go across fences because the only effective weed control is going to go across fences. If you just stop at the fence line, the weeds are going to be right back in your property the next year. So you have to have this bigger collaborative approach. And we've got it going here in a big way. We're just so fortunate to have really great collaborators. Danny's address says, if I was cheatgrass, I'd be shaking my boots. <laughs> I hope that's right. Here's uh, some more of that dead planting, trying to get rid of roads road management, because that's a big vector for cheatgrass. Um, and just, this is restoring the native habitat, get more of those perennials back in and uh, sage grass back in. This is another part of that story where we're out there with bags collecting sage grass seed in the fall. And then we take that seed and we, uh, and historically we've been able to get it to CSU Extension. They grow it out in a greenhouse and then they send us all these little baby sage brush plants. It's so beautiful to get the baby sage brush. We love them so much and we try to really take care of them and put love into the soil and we plant those things and we want them to grow and to take over. So this is exciting. Um, and here's the, this is one of the last slides, but this is the area where we're going to be really targeting this fall, late summer fall for uh, uh, a big cheatgrass eradication project. Uh, already last year, the BLM treated about 500 acres in this area, but it, the work is not done. And in fact, it's expanding uh, in front of our eyes, even with this treatment. So we've got to get on this one and we're, we're really excited about it. I think tomorrow, um, if you guys are going uh, with Alicia tomorrow, she'll show you this site, or at least looking up this. Uh, it's real close to that Dylan Pinnacle site. 
But here's some of the challenges, just having enough capacity. We talked about the coordination. That's going to be a game changer for this. We still don't even have good mapping and inventory of where the cheap press is, so we can't really even document how it's spreading or changing. It's just all anecdotal and uh, people's experience out there on the land. One of the interesting things that's a huge uh, bottleneck and a huge limitation is we don't really have anybody out there that we can hire to spray cheap grass. There aren't enough applicators, there aren't enough weed people out there that we can hire. So we, we're looking for entrepreneurs and people to get certified so that they, they have an army uh, that can do this. We do hire crews like uh, Western Colorado Conservation Corps and stuff like that to come in and help with some of these projects. Uh, but we just need more capacity there. Uh, do you guys know what NEPA is? This is a yeah, yeah. Well, it's all federal government. Yeah, but it, it was this act uh, passed in 1970 when it, like the first Earth Day, NEPA came, and it's the National Environmental Policy Act. And it's the thing that uh, requires environmental impact statements and uh, other kinds of environmental assessments. But the challenge here is that um, sometimes, even though NEPA is great and it really has protected our environment and helped us have uh, more guidance and limitations on what can happen on federal lands, uh, sometimes it can slow us down. In fact, NEPA is not allowing and other processes to the Right now, our BLM and Gunnison can't use regional right? So it could be a couple year process for them to figure out how to get through. Uh, just recently, we heard that now the higher ups in BLM have taken notice of this, and I think they're trying to expediate the process of them having the ability to use review on BLM. Uh, without that, it's really going to restrict, and then we have to use the less preferred herbicide uh, to treat cheatgrass on that land. Um, another one is being able to spray from helicopters. A lot of this land in these canyons is really challenging land and just trying to get people on there walking and really hard. We really need to do aerial spraying on some of this. Um, so we're trying to get those done. Uh, and then, yeah, coordination. So lots of challenges, but lots of hope, lots of new science and ideas. We kind of know what we need to do. We just need to do it. Now. So that's exciting. And we're starting to build the capacity. And this might be what uh, you see, right? This uh, sagebrush sea filled with wildflowers and grass. We don't want that monoculture of cheatgrass that just represents nothing of value in any way. So this is our goal. And of course, our biggest thing at stake is biodiversity overall. What's this thing? This thing. Yeah. And of course, we tell to 24% of the global population of green tailed toys nest in Western Colorado. Colorado has a uh, really high responsibility for this species, is how the bird conservation organizations call it a responsibility. In there. This bird depends on what happens in Western Colorado. So these kinds of projects are really important. The Brewer Sparrow has been declining. This is the most abundant bird in the state. The most abundant bird in the state. But there's a new category, some of you might be familiar with it in bird conservation. It's called uh, common birds in steep decline. These birds are disappearing in front of our face and we don't even know it. It's still the most common bird out there, but there's the Brewers Bear has been declining by over 2% annually since the Breeding Bird Survey started 50 years ago. So, what that means is if you are declining at 2% annually, your population is cut in half in 35 years. It's been 50 years. So the population of brewer spurs has been cut in half almost twice since we started collecting data. It's still the most common bird, but there's a lot, way fewer brewer sparrows on the landscape today than there was 50 years ago. I know many of you are familiar with the 2019 study out of Cornell that showed us that birds in general, we have 3 billion less birds on our landscapes in North America today, 30% less birds than we did 50 years ago. Birds are declining in general overall, and same in the sagebrush, sometimes worse with trends. So this is what's at stake, using these obligate, beautiful
wonderful bird species that depend on sagebrush, a healthy sagebrush ecosystem to keep those species on the farm. And it's also big game and winter habitat and so on. So this is just showing a map of part of Colorado. It's very colorful. All those colors represent different landowners. So here's the real challenge for Gunnison Sage Grouse Conservation is collaboration. You have to work together because sage grouse need large intact landscapes. They need the sage grouse seed. But those large intact landscapes have multiple landowners across that vast landscape. And so these people have to work together come up with a shared vision, common goal and purpose and bring resources together. And that's what we're doing. It's really exciting. But I hope we can do it fast enough to keep pace with the decline of the grouse and the decline of the So anyway, I'll end with that. And uh, thanks you guys for listening for so long. And you better go to bed. So um, let me, I should tell you a little bit about tomorrow. I put a, a little picture up here. This is Bass and Gunnison going the other way east uh, on Highway 50. <clears throat> and I know some of you probably been out there. 19 miles east of the road, 187 goes up to Lita Hot Springs. If you go nine miles up that road, you'll get to Lita Hot Springs. You might want to do that. That'd be cool. But uh, only six tenths of a mile of this road. So we're going east, we turn north. And you go six tenths of a mile. This is a really nice gravel road. Any car can get on it. Uh, and we have our watchful wildlife site. The site is um, less than half an acre in size. It's owned by uh, the uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And all of this is private land. This is all under conservation use. So but this is a state wildlife area. And you gotta go get your state wildlife area passes. So that's why I know it did not come. So, but it is a rule to have a state wildlife area pass. So if you haven't got one and you want to, you can go on the internet and get one. I think they're like fifteen dollars. Do we have to show it tomorrow? Um, if the CPW guy shows it, otherwise you won't. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, anyway, what we'll do, we'll meet here in the parking lot. Did everybody park out here at the south? Uh, parking lot. So meet there at 4 15 tomorrow morning. And I'm not going to be with you, but uh, I have two awesome people that are going to be with you tomorrow. Uh, Lauren is my student, and she's part of our team who has been uh, managing the Watchful Wildlife Site this year. So she'll be there. And then Dr. Jessica Young, who is a really um, amazing human being and a great scientist and a behavioral ecologist. And she was one of the people that named this as a new species, the first new species heard in North America in over 100 years. Jess knows more about them than Sagros than anybody else on the planet. So we get to spend some time with her tomorrow. So they'll meet you at 4 15 in the parking lot. Our goal is to caravan out to the site. Um, so hopefully we can take as few cars as possible. Um, so if you want to just drive from the hotel and then uh, get, 